This episode of Simulation Nation is brought to you by Avkin Incorporated, your one-stop shop for everything standardized patient and wearable simulator. Hey everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Simulation Nation. We are going to be talking to Alina Harrington today um, more about basically cost breakdown of each of your simulations, which I don't think we talk about very often in sim. I think that it's starting to become more of a topic where people are talking about, you know, the depreciation of mannequins, you know, sim by sim, or this thought of like, oh, if we're gonna let someone use our sim space, how much does that cost? And I think it's a real deficit because I don't think it comes naturally to a lot of us. Absolutely right? not. Yeah. yeah. I don't know very many nurses that have had business courses in their undergraduate. Well, and, and like it. Cause I think that's the other piece too, is it's like, there's so much math and other pieces that go into it. It's just like, oh, okay, now we're going to do, you know, this budgetary or, or not budgetary, but cost effectiveness. It just gets into the weeds of it. And I think it's so not anyone's natural lean well it is elena it's elena's and again <laughs> that is the beauty is that we get to learn from her and i think that the way that she breaks it down of how she thought through it makes so much sense right yeah. it, it, you look at it and you're like oh okay yeah no when you put it in those terms you know in terms of a hospital or in top terms of an or and things like that I think it does translate a little bit easier, right? Because yes. then you're like, oh, okay, but then for my sim center, this is how I'm going to, you yeah. know, add this well, in. Well, I, th I think in simulation, we talk a lot about framing or reframing. Mm -hmm. And so she really took yeah. what she had learned in yeah. her skill set as an OR nurse yeah. and brought it to a whole different you know, location. So when you think of like the Kirkpatrick levels, mm -hmm. she's now at a Kirkpatrick three, mm -hmm. right? Where she's transferring her knowledge to a different way. And I think for most of us who weren't in the OR and didn't really have access to understanding, okay, how much does each OR session cost, mm -hmm. right? Um, and looking at even any of the cost breakdown, it really became, I, I can remember them talk, I went to a presentation on creating a, um, a business, a business, um, case mm -hmm. you know and going through that piece and it was really you know it, it almost kind of you glaze over yeah. until you do it for the first time i mean i remember doing a business strategy for avkin and you know you just you almost have to sit down and roll your sleeves up but mm -hmm. but what elena did was she really took her skill set and her knowledge base to then really be able to break down each simulation and how much each simulation costs per student and how at what at what point in time are they going to need to replace those mannequins based off of the depreciation, the life value, all of that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, and so then when you approach budget, you're approaching it from a non-emotional side. Well, and I think you're able to approach it so much like ahead of time, right? Rather than it's the mannequin broke down and that's normal because we're at our five years. And so now I need a replacement mannequin, right? You're getting ahead of it and saying, Hey, in 2025, June of 2025, yeah. my mannequin is going to be at the five li five year mark and I'm going to need to start replacing it at yeah. that point. So like it gives you so much more foresight into what you're looking at. And I think that I'm really excited because this topic came up years ago and yep. I can remember you mentioning this yes, offhand yes, yes. to me. Like I think we were traveling and you just like mentioned it offhand of like, yeah, well, one of my sim sisters, Elena, she fa she broke it down and figured out the cost exactly per sim. And I remember it stuck with me that when we were going into this y season of Simulation Nation, me bringing up the fact that I think this is such a great topic to talk yeah. more about because I just think number one, as nurses, it's not something that is in the front of our brain, right? We are just thinking we got to get through the day. We'll order supplies when we need supplies. And we just keep chugging along in terms of Or even of the knowing what a capital budget is. Like, like nobody, nobody sits you down when you yeah. take a job <laughs> as a simulation coordinator yeah. in 2006 and says, okay, so here's line items. And this is what a capital budget is. And this is what an operating budget is. And this is, and this is how you, you plan for the future like, of that. Not just what you need right now, but then this is how you also scale it so that you can grow with all the incoming students students that are right. going to be coming in. But, but I think, and we'll talk a lot more about budgets when we get to Crystal Farina, but the idea of this, of knowing how much each simulation costs and how much each student costs as they go through, it takes the emotion out of it and it really looks at it, at it in practical terms. And it gives you the ability that when they say we're increasing enrollment by X yes. amount of students, yes. you then say, well, this is how much it's going to cost for that to happen. Right. This is going to be- This is how many more mannequins we're going to need or how sooner, mm -hmm. much sooner we're going to need it or 
wearable simulators even, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> but it's that concept so. too of even like room space and being able to add in some of that too, where then it just gives you, like you said, that business case to then go in. And it's not this, I'm overwhelmed. We can't handle that, right? Like it's not that conversation. It's okay. If that's what that the decision is from leadership in terms of increasing enrollment, this is now what I need to be able to run a sim center. Yeah. There you go. Right. Yeah. And then and then that's that's the conversation. Well, and the, the really cool thing with Elaine is because she's an educator, she's able to take something that she has a lot of knowledge on mm-hmm. that's that seems so second nature to her mm-hmm. and explain it to someone who doesn't have that knowledge base. Yeah. And I think that's real really where the beauty of it is, is taking what she's which what, what she shares with us in this in this podcast mm-hmm. and then transferring it to where you you know where you are and what you're being asked to put mm-hmm. forward or maybe what the pushback is that you're getting or things yeah. along those lines so that's really to my in my perspective is it's not just that she did this and it's really cool because it is so cool yeah. but it's also that she's able to explain it in a way that is relatable to the people that are going to be listening to yeah. this podcast. Yeah. And she's so fun and I think that that's almost like the difference is you'd almost expect when you talk to somebody about this kind of concept right of like evaluating your sim costs you know, sim by sim, student by student, you're like, okay, it's going to sound like the Charlie Brown, like womp, 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 womp as we go through this, you know, like you would almost nah, expect that you're going to glaze over. But Elena's just so fun in terms of like her personality, how she goes through it, that you're like, oh, I could do that. Oh, yeah. it's so, there's a it's little so easy. negative information. Yeah. So we're going to get yeah. more into the interview um, so you guys can hear it and we'll stop talking about how excited we are for you to be able to hear it. But again, this is Elena Harrington and kind of her going into her background as an OR nurse and then how she went in to break down cost per simulation. Yeah. And how she transitioned that to each of the different places that she's been in the, in the meantime. All right, Elena, thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you. And what we're really trying to do is kind of get down to the nuts and bolts of how you get get price your simulations and get a cost for that. And that can be reported back up to leadership, or it also could be something that utilize as a tool for outside people that want to utilize your sim center. So thanks so much for joining us. And uh, I just want you to talk a little bit about your back history Um, and what kind of, you know, what, what health, what, where were you in the health professions world and what brought you into simulation? So if you just spend a few minutes telling us about that, that would be great. Well, thank you so much for having me, Amy. I really enjoy your podcast and I enjoy your products as well. So, uh, I think that's important to know where I came from, to know what my frame of mind was and how I kind of started figuring out the cost of each scenario. So I was an operating room nurse, came right out of, um, nursing school into the operate operating room. And so in the operating room, there's so many similarities and I really didn't realize it until I started thinking about my thought process. So there are different programs. Uh, Of course, uh, there's orthopedics, like general, plastics, neuro. There's so many different departments that you have to work with, not to mention different professions. So when I came to work in simulation, there were like 13 different programs I was working with. So I kind of saw them as the same in little um, department. So I also had lots of technology that I had to learn and use in the OR. Um, A lot of times it was the first time I've ever used it and I'm working in the middle of the night and nobody else is there. So I'm forced to have to learn how to do it. So that's how simulation is a lot of times. And you've just got to go with the flow. Um, Also in surgery, we, I hate to say it, but we refer patients sometimes to like the case and we talk about the case. So you have to do a lot of prep for each case, just like you do a simulation. And then you have the surgery or the sim, and then you have the cleanup and the debrief. A lot of times the debrief is how slow can we go so we don't get another case or (laughs) how can we blame this on anesthesia? No, just kidding. Um, (laughs) You do kind of have that same flow. Mm -hmm. Um, But I envision simulation when I came to it as like working with a doctor for the first time. So when I had a new faculty member or a new doctor I needed to work with, I needed to know what they needed. And sometimes you're not going to know that until right before the event. Luckily in simulation, we've learned that we've got to prepare. But um, in surgery, we relied on what's called is a pick sheet. And the pick sheet could make or break you. It, It would have the instructions about what the surgeon prefers, Um, What are their habits? You know, how do they want to set up the case? How maybe even does anesthesia need to move the patient in the room? Um, Special instruments that are going to be needed. Um, 
So that is what I compared to as like our detailed template when we were going to set up for a simulation. So all of this is so parallel to me. Um, inside of those pick sheets, so we would have those outside of our door and then we would have like a case cart with all the cases for the day. Hopefully materials management was on top of it and they had all our stuff pulled. And if you came in first thing in the morning, you'd have all your, um, the night crew might have your stuff set up for the day, just like with a simulation that you might have it ready. Yeah, so, that's, that, that comes after we had sim techs that can help us with that kind of stuff. Yes, typically, of course. Typically in the beginning, it was us getting it. But yes, it definitely so has agree. evolved for sure. And that sim techs are so vitally important to the simulations. Oh, yeah. They really sure. are. They can make or break you as well. Mm -hmm. But um, so with that, the cases on the side, I kind of envisioned if we could just have shoe boxes like that for each one of our cases. So I had the shoe boxes and but we needed to know what things needed to go in the shoe boxes. All right. So um, we had pick sheets and the pick sheets would have on it everything that you needed for that case. And so I found if we had pick sheets for our simulations, it would help us know how to reuse the same materials over and over and help prevent repetitive tasks from costing time. Um, now you said so it that, was in a, you said it was in a shoe box. I so would put it in a plastic shoe box. How did you fit all the simulation stuff in a sim shoe box? Cause I always felt like I was carrying around those giant plastic containers that you would see at Walmart. How did you get it condensed down to that small of a size? So a lot of times it was, um, the patient armband, you know, the medications, we would just have the same medications already mm -hmm. done up. Um, it was, it was, it's really less than you think that you need in your cases. Maybe um, I, I'm just, I'm kind of like, um, I like to have everything with me. So it may just be that I just overdid it, but that just always seemed to be, I needed the big giant ones instead of the small And it might boxes. be that we had our room standardized. So we had mm -hmm. supplies already in the room. So this yes. was the thing. So we had to, add in addition to the supplies because though. you are an OR nurse right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep you know you just got to think about your patient's going to be lying there and your patient's not talking they're breathing just like a mannequin is so right. it, there's so many similarities yeah so now everybody in simulation might want to be an OR nurse yeah for sure I've met a lot of ER nurses that are simulationists not a lot of OR nurses but I think again that skill set that you developed in the OR really led to you being able to get into simulation, draw those similarities and, and draw from your experiences to make your simulation much more organized and much more, you know, the flow very similar to an OR where in any given day, you might be doing four cases. They might be different cases, but you had that process and system set up or you at least experienced that where you were as a nurse and that, that translated then into the sim center. Mm -hmm. And then you could always have that crazy level one, an emergency. And so you have to know how to handle that and handle yourself. Yeah. yeah. So just like so with simulation. Just like when the, when the mannequin goes down, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to come up with a plan B. Or yeah, the SP excellent. isn't there or they get sick or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that, so that pick sheet's going to come in in a, in a minute with another question that I have. But before we get to that, I really want to talk about our experience as at the, in the NLN simulation group. So um, on our podcast in the past, we've talked about the idea of if you haven't been a part of one of the fellowships and Anaxel has a fellowship, SSH has a fellowship, but we were part of the NLN, National League for Nursing Simulation Leadership group in 2015 and we call ourselves the sim sisters um and it was it was a bond that we created with um you know i would say we, we started with 20 but i would say that at this point we have about 10 of the core group that is stuck together we still present together obviously we're doing a podcast together um it it really developed me personally um it was at the time that i was at that crossroads of trying to decide whether we were going to start the company or not and we were actually just talking about this we have virtual happy hours uh, you know every you know probably two or three times a year but um i was at the, i was at that crossroads so tell me a little bit about what this fellowship meant for you as far as your professional and personal growth Oh my gosh, I, this was my make or break moment. This was how I gained confidence in myself. Um, had, got sisters that helped me talk about what problems I was having. They genuinely wanted to know what was going on and how they could help support me and help grow me. Um, I think I was the youngest in the group. So um, 
I got to benefit from everybody's experience. Um, being the youngest, I had struggled finding projects that I could get involved with. And um, so after this, I never struggled finding a project anymore. <laughs> I just had to learn and I said yes to everything. So after I said yes to everything, it kind of became a chain reaction of cool events that kept happening and cool opportunities. So um, I just can't thank my Sim sisters enough because um, it, it just goes naturally now and we're a family. Yeah, for sure. I think that um, I read a book when I was getting ready to start the company. It's called The Stiletto Network. I don't remember who the author was, but that what it talks about is that it's a group of women that have each other's backs no matter what and that they are cheering each other on and that they have similar um, abilities but but complementary, right? So they're not necessarily exactly the same. Um, mm -hmm. And even though we were all in simulation, I think we all had different, we were at different personal, professional levels, personal levels. Um, but I think from, from my perspective, I think that we really formed that stiletto network, that, that group of women that no matter what, we had each other's backs and we would cheer each other on no matter what. And to me, that was... That was a huge confidence boost for me as well, because as I was starting the company, it was like, well, if the company, you know, if, 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 if everybody isn't as excited about these wearable simulators as I am, then at least I know that these, these other women know that I tried my hardest and that I did my best and that I really was doing something that was of, of value for the simulation community. And it, it, it was huge for me um, as far as confidence goes, for sure. I remember flying home with you, Amy, from our first um, meeting and just getting to know you more personally. And I was just taken back. By, oh, my gosh, look at how much innovation she has and and um, push to do more. And, I, mm. you know, I think that also motivated me to um, do bigger and better things. Yeah. And I think the other big thing for me, as far as the Sim, Sim Network was, when you're in simulation, at least at that time, was you didn't have anybody else really within your your in, your academic institution to weigh yourself against. Like there, you know, it was kind of like one man, maybe two man bands. And so when we got together and we were all like, oh my gosh, you're doing incredible things. Oh my gosh, you're doing incredible things. Um, it really was that, that value add to to that, that what we were doing was really making a difference for our learners and for the simulation community. So that really, for me, just rubbing shoulders with other people that were like-minded and had similar tr career trajectories just helped me understand that, yeah, I had been doing some really cool things. And I remember pulling you aside and going, you are amazing. You're young, but you're amazing. You're going to do great things, and I know it. And I just, I remember you and Katie both just thinking, like, somebody's going to tell these younger professionals that they're doing amazing, amazing things in their profession. Wow. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you're you. welcome. I'm glad, <laughs> I'm just really glad that we, again, we've we've connected and we've stayed connected, which, um, you know, it's, some of the NLN mentors say that not every group is as close as we are. But um, I do consider it to be a complete honor to be a, mm -hmm. a part of that 2015 group for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So tell me a little bit about how you took that pick sheet okay. and that, that, then that translated then to really you being able to break down the cost of your simulations really specifically um, and identify that. Okay. So when you start a new Sim Center, everybody in the community wants to use your Sim Center. Mm -hmm. And they think since your school benefits from some of their things that they have going on, maybe your school, the students go to the, their hospital for clinical. And so they think that we could just inverse let their employees come to our school for simulation. Um, that did not really compute because I knew that there were costs associated with that. And there's really not a whole lot of the cost to have people go to clinical. But I needed a nice way to be able to say that because I needed to maintain those relationships with the hospital. So I had to find some objective data. So I thought about our pick sheets that we had. So in the OR, we have the pick sheets and it had the how much each supply was. And, and some of them would just make you crazy to know how much um, a tourniquet is or something like that. But um, with the pick sheets, 
it was very much a way for me to calculate the entire cost of what the simulation was. And then I could also show what the, um, if we did benefit from it, what would be the cost comparison from having this group come in or what if they broke a mannequin, you know, because those are expensive. Um, sure. When you get into the really thing, big things about the rental cost, I know that was something that a lot of people asked me about whenever I wrote a blog about this. They wanted to know, how did I come up with this rental cost? And so I called the rental company because <laughs> I call it a rental cost because you're basically renting the, the equipment mm -hmm. at the time that you're util utilizing it. If it's an organization outside of yours. Um, and I found out that they charge about 10% um, for each time that somebody rents the piece of equipment. And that's how they justified being able to repair the expense and um, how to update their equipment. So, so that's just any rental, like if it was somebody's renting tables for an event or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That okay. was the average of that. So then mm -hmm. using that model, that kind of made sense for supplies and things like that. And then I started thinking about, okay, well, SimMan 3G costs about $100,000. It really doesn't make sense for me to charge somebody $10,000 to use SimMan 3G. Mm -hmm. So I went to a 1% model, which was $1,000, which really would, if something happened to SimMan, it would help cover that cost. It might mm -hmm. not cover it all, but it would average out over, over the long term. So... I went with the 1% for large equipment items. Okay. And so did you factor in like the warrant? Did you add, mm -hmm. again, I'm assuming that if people did come in from the outside, that you were bringing, bringing in some money to, to the SIM center. So mm -hmm. did you like utilize some of that money towards uh, additional warranties to make sure that it would last longer or at least be maintained? So I built the warranty in my price. So the overall 100000 it had warranty in it. Oh, for, gotcha. So gotcha. It, it's built in the original base. Gotcha. And so you so you took SimMan, you charged 1% of the cost of that for each day of rental or each hour mm -hmm. or? Yep, that comes down to um, you have to decide that. And so yeah. you, you have to work with your team and your stakeholders to see what's a reasonable cost. And um, I ended up doing it per day because okay. it just made more sense. And I, I sure. didn't want to um, seem like I was overcharging somebody either. Right, right. So 1% for the mannequins, 10% for other small pieces of equipment that would probably not be as, you know, they, they wouldn't have warranties with them or something along those lines. And then what about like disposables and the disposable costs and things like that? So um, a lot of disposables we just reuse. So we don't really have to do a charge for those. But um, if there are, we just charge the amount that they cost. Okay. Because we would have, um, we could have, depends on the group, um, a, fa a facility charge where they have to pay to be in the facility and for the rooms that they're using. Yeah, that's what I was, that was going to be my next question was like, so did you have a charge on space as well as the mannequins and non-reusable disposables and the other equipment and things along yes. those lines? Yes, and there and it was broken down per what that organization um, was, if they were um, a third party or if they actually did things with our group. Um, sometimes they were movie productions, so, you know, it really... Wow didn't make us have to do a lot of extra work. So it depends on how much involvement we had to do. Gotcha. Uh, the movie productions really, we just needed somebody there off hours because they wanted to film um, weird hours of the, the day. Huh. Interesting. So then, so space wise, you, it just depended on the rooms that they were going to use and you just assigned a charge, a daily charge to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then did you have, you know, you talked about, utilization of t the staff or the, the team that you had. Um, did you have an administrative fee that went along with that as well? Um, yes, we did. It, it especially if we were going to use standardized patients, because that would cost more to have to arrange their schedule and things like that. Sure, sure. And so 
when you when you calculated all this, did you have it like in an Excel and it was just a fee calculator? You just plugged the numbers mm-hmm. in and it, you know, how many days and what, and they, they kind of gave you the pick list of the things that they would need yes. from your spaces? And how we came up with some of these fees is I compared um, over across the country what their fees are. And then I did um, a calculation of what, I mean, I'm in Mississippi, so we have a lower cost of living. So I divided out the cost of living here by the cost of living there to find out what the true number would be here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I guess probably inquiring why minds want to know, how did you get movie sets that were co- contacting you and asking to utilize that space? That's really cool. So I um, just reached out to the local film uh, crews in the area and their social media groups and um, it really wasn't that hard. Um, not all, I've worked at several STEM centers and not all STEM centers are open to this idea, but, um, it it was great for us. It was a great way to get, um, revenue outside revenue and get to meet some exciting actors. Yeah, that's fun. That, so you, so you did some outreach, you did some marketing of your SIM program to Mm -hmm. get Mm -hmm. people to come in. I mean, obviously, as you said, it depends on the institution. I know for us, um, with, with the program that I developed with standardized patients, we did, we did do a lot of outside contracts with that, but just getting set up as a two book account within an institution. So I don't know for those of you that don't know what a two book account is. Most universities work off a one book account where they, you know, the revenue comes in from the the student tuition and, you know, obviously state funding and things along those lines and goes into a certain procurement account account number for the sim lab and you can buy things from it but you can't put money back in so the two book account is that you can bring money in and the money goes out and they just I remember our financial people saying it's very unusual for any departments within um, you know within health sciences to have a two book account but for us it made sense because we did have some some outside revenue coming in from um, some of the contracts that we utilized our standardized patient methodology with so um, that's amazing that you had that support. And so tell me a little bit about how you marketed this. So you talked about you contacted some movie agencies. How else did you market that to get some uh, some other people from the community to utilize your SIM Center? I really did not have to market it. It just word of mouth about how beneficial it was. Um, one of the things that we did work with is the local um ambulance services, we contacted them because they were all interested in doing simulation and they had previously worked with other um, hospitals around the area and um, before they didn't have any competitive pricing and they didn't have um, standardization of what they're doing. So tell me a little bit about how else you marketed this tool, like having these different um, movie sets wanting to come in, like what else did you do to get uh, people from the outside your institution to be interested in utilizing your sim space? Well, um, I reached out to local reps. So working in the OR, I had lots of um, contact with organizations like Stryker, Zimmer, and to see if they were interested in coming and utilizing our facility to bring, you know, residents in to train or um, local uh, ambulance companies. They were, were always interested in training their paramedics um, doing more advanced courses, and um, we could be more competitive than some of the places that they were formally going to. So yeah, lots of amazing. opportunities there. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I think that, that we were we were first found out about with our standardized patient program um, through having actually the newspaper come in and do a story on us. And when they Googled it, um, they, they found that, you know, they, oh, the University of Delaware has this amazing program. Let's, you know, let's start working with them. So we started off as a clinical practice partnership with our local tertiary care hospital and then expanded then into like the pediatric hospital and stuff like that. So that's, yeah, we didn't have to do much work, but I will say that my theater partner was much better at marketing what we were doing than I was. So I always, I always tell people, take the time to Get it out there. You know, there, there's a lot of media that's very interested in what we're doing because it's such an active learning process. And it, it's, it really reads very well, whether it's visual or verbal, um, about the amazing active learning styles that we have uh, in simulation. So getting back to the tool a little bit, tell me a little bit about how you use that tool once you were able to develop it, the fee calculator, you know, option. 
So the business office at the multiple places that I've worked at before, they speak a different language than us. Yes. They need to see numbers. They need to see what this number means and what this number means. So they didn't understand why the center wasn't stable. Like why after five years do you need all new equipment? <laughs> so mm. they, they, this showed them that there was um, a, already a model out there for rental companies and how they replace their equipment and that their equipment isn't going to last long and it has to be updated. So that really made sense to them. So that was how we um, broke that barrier. Um, it also gave me a way of breaking down the departments and how much each department costs. And that is something that I'm using right now because um, as I'm building a new STEM center, we are exploring different ways of, of making sure we're able to sustain it from the ground up. So at the first place I was at, there was 13 different programs. Well, one program might have a grant and it would pay for simulation. So we needed to isolate what that percentage was. So that tool helped do that. Um, it also helped me with our, we had, it was an inventory management system. So we would put things in there and it would help me see when their restocking alerts were and when I needed to reorder. And then also um, it helped me be more active with um, the ordering processes um, and being cost e efficient. Mm -hmm. So when you say you had an inventory management system, did you create that from the ground up or did you utilize an inventory management system? I utilized the WAS inventory management. Okay. System. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I, I was, I'm familiar with it. I don't know if everybody else is, but they have some really cool stuff um, as far as inventory management. Um, and so it's wasp, like mm -hmm. the animal, the, like, the insect. You're going to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in looking that up, it is something that's helpful. It's not super expensive, um, at least when it, when I was when I was doing utilizing it. Um, so that's the, it is a great system there. So so you're saying now you've even taken some of that into what you're doing currently at your new space or your new position, which is actually building a sim center kind of from the ground up or from the walls up, walls in at least. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about as far as the benefits and drawbacks of that tool that, that you... So as I'm building a new SIM center, I learned that really an inventory management system wasn't needed. I didn't need to track that constantly. Um, so it was really laborious what I had done initially when I put all those supplies in the system and I didn't calculate that. But now I kind of have a base to go by. And so I can use that when I'm looking at doing a stroke scenario or something like that. So it gives me um, a foundation to compare to. Um, and now I reuse a lot of supplies. So in the OR, um, if you were an OR nurse, or you might even know being in the ER, Amy, the pill packs, when you would open a pill pack. So I reseal all of our supplies with that. And we use the WASP system and print a barcode and make it look like it's an actual um, product. So there's a lot of other creative ways that you can um, do this. So just having a pick sheet with a list and then use, utilizing that formula is um, helpful, but you don't necessarily need an inventory system. Well, again, I trust you for your organizational knowledge more than myself. We, we actually... Um, had a whole recycling program where we restocked kits. So we took the kits that were there and recreated them. And we had um, uh, work study students. So students that were on the federal work study program and we created processes for repacking the kits so that it all went back the way that the students would see it. Um, and they did a calculation and they saved about $86,000 a year um, in disposables by you know, and that includes paying the, the federal work study students. But, you know, we all know how expensive those kits are. But, um, you know, it, it took some space and some time and, and definitely some inventory. But um, they were super creative. You know, if you think of like the sterile, um, the sterile mm -hmm. uh, drapes that go out, we would use the dental bibs, you know, mm -hmm. because they're non-sterile. They don't need to be sterile because mm -hmm. it's a sim center. Um, but it, it was, you know, they, they came up with some really creative. Uh, they utilized... Um, the pretzel, the the plastic that goes on pretzel rods to cover the urinary catheter back up. So ah. there's some really creative ways, and you can actually even perforate that that with a um, 
it's a special uh, sewing tool. But so there's ways to get super creative to um, save money and also to reduce waste. You know, I mean, ultimately that that's very helpful as well. Okay, so you need to get somebody to put that on the homegrown solution page. It's a partnership with the NLN and Anasco. And that's where you can put all these helpful things that people can save money on. So that would be good. All right. Definitely. I'll definitely, um, I mean, I, I, it wasn't my idea. So I'll definitely talk to Heidi before, before I put it on there. But if she doesn't have time, I'll, I'll be happy to, to contribute uh, to the knowledge. But she has, she's super creative with that. That's definitely her, that was her, her baby that she did an amazing job with. As well as Amy Buka, who used to be, a sim tech for us at the university who now works with me at Afkin. They they kind of came up with that program together. So so that's a peer reviewed site and it's a great way for sim techs to be um, recognized for their accomplishments. Yeah, and I get again those creative ideas. We all have them, right? Mm-hmm. And um, just to spend a few seconds to go into that homegrown solutions. Are you still um, leading that charge with? with keeping that site active? I'm not, but I just want to make sure everybody realizes yeah. it's there because it's such an awesome resource. It has it is. videos and pictures and step-by-step instructions. Yeah, perfect. The other really good, amazing resource that's a, a free resource is the MedEd portal. I don't know if any, anybody with a .edu uh, email can have access to that MedEd portal. There's lots of great articles there. Um, if you're, you know, at a community college that doesn't have a huge library or mm-hmm. access to a lot of resources, it might be helpful for you. But there's also simulations. Probably not. They're all. They're a lot medically oriented, but it might give you some good ideas for um, getting started. You're obviously going to need to modify them, but there's a lot of great, great resources at that MedEd portal as well. Mm-hmm. It really is. Now you said you meant you mentioned that you did a blog on this. <clears throat> So is there is there somewhere that we can send people putting a link into the to the um, description so that they can go there and find the, yes, the blog? Yes, it's on the National League of Nursing website, and um, it is their Tech Edge blog. And um, there are several blogs that I wrote on that website, and they they d- now do do a podcast as well. So that's great. a great way to get information. Great. So I just want to go back to one thing because I think it's really important and I know it's probably, I'm skipping around a little bit, but you mentioned that the business office does not speak the same language as we do, right? And so I think that it's really important um, that as we are thinking about, you know, moving into this role of being a professional and moving into a leadership role, you do, as nurses, we are empathetic and we can when we understand how people think or we understand what motivates people, typically we can modify our behaviors to really, you know, help them to understand. But for me personally, I had no business background or business knowledge. Did you come into this with a business background or business knowledge? I did get my master's in nursing administration and my doctorate. So, I mean, um, but I did that after I got started with simulation. So I guess no. So you, you probably are like, I need to know, know more about this. So so much about myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I think that it's, it's the nursing curriculum is so packed. There's, it's really hard to say, oh, they should take business classes, but it is good to avail yourself to understand how business offices work or um, how they think. I think also people that, you know, are deans and directors that are in leadership, they have to be thinking in that way too, right? They, they have a budget that, that, that they're accountable for. There's a lot of needs and a lot of requests. So when you're able to kind of understand their perspective and present things in ways that may help them understand, um, it really does add to the conversation and takes away from the mother may I all the time, right? If you're saying, look, this is the cost for simulations, whether they do it outside or whether we do it within the sim center. And so you can see the cost and, and this mannequin depreciating over time and, you know, all of that. So it does speak the language and it explains why, you know, that you do need to replace products. You do need to get, you know, additional technology or um, that you your, your students shouldn't be learning on things from the 1960s, right? <laughs> so that it does, definitely does help to begin to understand that. So can we talk a little bit about you moved from your the position where you were working with 13 different disciplines and you actually were brought in by a grant and in the state of Mississippi and you developed this academy for simulation training there. Can you talk a little bit about this academy and what what your job role was at that position? 
So it was a foundation where um, all the schools were coming to them and saying, we need help training our nursing faculty. And so instead of paying all the different schools, they wanted to have one individual that could help coordinate that for all the programs across the state. So I did a needs assessment across the state to see what was the needs. What did they know about? What did they not know about? And I used um, Sabrina, our STEM sisters, um, tool that she developed the past, and it was based on a NASCAR's best practices and the NSBN study. And so I just used that to find out what we needed to teach. So I created um, with another STEM sister um, in Indiana, Julie, uh, so an online module that were seven, and we wrote about this in an article as well, and wrote down simulation fundamentals and what they needed to know. And it gave them a way to meet one accreditation standards because you have to have a formalized way of training your simulation faculty. And also it standardized how simulation was done across our state. And I have to say, I think we've added about eight or 10 more chessies in our state. So I'm excited to see that growth and movement. So now the um, what we're doing with the academy, I'm not there anymore. I turned it over, but we buy, bought virtual reality equipment for everyone in the state, and they are able to use that to pilot different um, virtual reality platforms. It's not for just one, and they can go back and show their administration that data, and so maybe they can get buy-in again from those mm-hmm. business leaders. Of, yes. Um, how that could impact their program. Great. So by standardizing that training across the state of Mississippi what, and doing that needs assessment, what were some of the biggest needs that you, you were able to identify utilizing Sabrina's tool? The biggest needs, I would say, is policies and procedures. They did not have that. They did not have... Um, they didn't even have enough people to run it. So they didn't have the backing of somebody else to say that. They did not have um, a lot of, a lot, (laughs) it's sad. Uh, Definitely debriefing, um, IPE, interprofessional activities was almost non-existent. Um, Evaluation was almost non-existent. So um, there was a lot of work to be done with that. And yeah. this was this was many years ago. So. Yeah, right. This was many years ago. But the, it's interesting that you say debriefing because we did um, when we do our sim summits. One of the uh, one of the presentations that we do is a hands on debriefing exercise with SPs because I again, you know, debriefing obviously you, it, people need help with just debriefing skills in general. But also when you add an SP to the to the mix of the debriefing process, there's some changes or some, you know, there's an additional person to be considering with that. And so when we did our demonstration, the first time we did it at Sam Houston State University, people came up to us and said, you know, I really appreciate that you gave us an opportunity to watch someone else do a debriefing session. Um, you know, they read about it, but it's just like we expect our students to go from didactic, you know, um, learning and then apply it in clinical simulations that bridge where we get a chance to try it you know to, to have the students try it out um that th- they said the same thing where they learned about it they learned about it theoretically and they've done it but they don't know if they're doing it right they've never really had a chance to watch other people unless they're doing peer review within their university but typically we're working with smaller schools um and so that really was to me very eye-opening that they really enjoyed observing someone else do a, you know, do an actual simulation debriefing. But it is, you know, just getting, being able to observe and ask questions and interact in a way that is right there in the room was seemed to be very helpful for them. So it definitely is for sure. We partnered with our um, board of nursing and we were able to bring people to this, to our site. Um, We really focused on the LPNs with them to broaden that. Um, So yes, I totally agree. Being there on on site is very important. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about what you're doing now or alluded to what you're doing now, but tell us a little bit about where you are, what position you're in, and where's the Sim Center being built? Okay, so I am at Mississippi State University um, in the SEC. It's a huge college. Um, It's one of our major colleges in our state, but in the past, it has not had any healthcare really. 
And so a couple of years ago, they dove in and they started a physician assistant program. And it was the first publicly um, institute with PAs in our state. And so now we are looking at opening a brand new school of nursing. Um, it is pending and we are planning on uh, opening in August and it will be an accelerated master's degree. And um, so we're really excited about that there. Where we're at is um, downtown Meridian. It is a city that we're trying to revitalize. There are not a lot of nurses here, period, especially um, advanced practice nurses. Not, not, when I say advanced practice, I don't mean nurse practitioners. I just mean trained at a higher level. So we're really trying to bring the quality here to this community. And um, so it is in an old opera house and it's been redone we have um, lots of cool people that come here and then the sim center is actually in an old department store so we are in the process of building that now so 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 the health professions school is in an old opera house no the opera house we revitalized it's still an opera house and it's connected to our sim center that was an old department store so we are in the heart of downtown meridian Wow, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. So one of the big things I remember when I first started and we were doing our first construction just on a room, you know, a new, I'd gotten a new classroom and we were converting it to sim space. And I can remember the architects asking me, so what, what do you want in here? And I'm like, oh, I want two hospital beds and I want a sink. And they're like, no, 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 behind the walls. Where do you want the electric? Where do you want the water? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I've only just walked into a space and had it available to me and I utilized the space the way it was. So the first time I had to think about where the plumbing would be, where the electric outlets would be, how the head walls were going to be hooked in. Do we do we want actual oxygen, which we weren't we weren't associated with the hospital. So we didn't have the real thing. But how how is all of that going to work? Where's the compressed air um tank going to go, you know, where's the safe space for it? So it was really interesting. I can't imagine trying to do construction on a whole building. I'm sure it's overwhelming. It is. And um, they have all those questions already and they want to know where I'm going to hang my sharps container and my my soap dispenser. I'm like, why do you need to know this yet? We don't even have framing up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I remember that too. I definitely remember we, we could put a call, we tried to put a call bell system in um, to our, some of our sims because of the way that we wanted them to flow. And it took, it took a lot of thought and work. So definitely empathize with those that are getting their sim centers started. Yeah, there's a lot of people starting some new sim centers. So that's exciting. Yeah. So as we wrap up here, um, I just, one, I want to say we will go ahead and try to get that link posted to her blog so that you guys have a reference for um, this tool that we've been talking about. But I do think for those of you who are former OR nurses, utilizing that skill set is amazing. Um, in the ER, we never knew how much anything cost, <laughs> nor did we have pick sheets. Um, we just had the clean supply. So that's it's a great resource and a great um, way of take, transferring the knowledge that you had from your you know historical um, you know work as a nurse into the Sim Center, and lots of great co- correlations. But my fun question is. Um, how do you know, how, when, did, when or how did you know that you actually crossed the threshold to, I am now a simulationist? What was your? When I had a crisis situation at home and I thought simulation was the solution. <laughs> <laughs> Six-year-old, um, after New Year's, she, the first tour that I made her do, she had to um, unload the dishwasher. And, of course, she brings the ninja blade to me and says, Mommy, what's this and where does it go? Of course, we drop it on our foot and totally slice it. The ER could not sedate her. Like, they literally couldn't. And um, it took a lot. Um, So when it was time to get her stitches out, we knew that was going to be almost an impossible task. It seems like very simple, and Mommy could definitely do it because she's a nurse. But um, no one was going to be touching that foot. So I knew we had to do a simulation to teach her how do you take it out and let her be the doctor for another little girl. And so she did. She took out the stitches and it just really helped her mentally prepare for that procedure. And so when she went in, we went back to the ER. I know to remove some stitches, but she told the ER doctor, no, I got it. I've done this before. (laughs) She pulled out her own stitches. So, um, yeah, I just think whenever it transforms into your personal life, you know you're a simulationist. 
That's a great one. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Appreciate all the amazing work that you're doing in simulation. And thank you for all of that hard work. Thank you, Amy. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. All right. So that was our interview with Elena. I think that the big thing that I always, I don't know, that I really like to see with it is her being able to just take such unique skills that she developed in a completely different context Mm -hmm. and then be able to take that and transfer it. And I think that the thing that I just appreciate so much is the lack of almost understanding how unique it is of how her brain works, right? And I think that that's something that is so cool to be able to identify and be able to point out in other people, being able to say, like, this is not normal that you can do this the way that you're doing this, or, like, the way that you can just transfer this information and make it so accessible for people is not a normal thing to be able to do that, right? But when you get to that level of expertise and just humbleness and great, awesome people, you know what I mean? It's just so cool to be able to see how that stuff can just transfer so easily in terms of them being able to be like, well, let me just break this down for you in this context. And she's still so humble. But I remember, I remember at the end of our 20, 2020, 2015 NLN sim group, I, because she's younger Mm -hmm. and is so humble. I pulled her aside. I'm like, you don't know how talented you are. Yeah. Like you have so much potential Mm -hmm. and it's just been really cool to see her grow in her career Mm -hmm. and to take on new challenges and new risks and do new amazing things. I mean, she's now starting a whole new sim program Mm -hmm. at Mississippi State Yeah, and building a sim center and all of those things. So just seeing her go from where she was at a community college and fighting for um, a director title and Mm -hmm. now moving on into these like really prestigious schools and being able to you know, take things from the roots forward. So it's an yeah. interprofessional sim center. It's brand new. And I'm just really excited to see where this is going to take her. Yeah. Yeah. It's so exciting. And I think that it's just so awesome to have someone like Elena, who, again, just has such a unique ability to look at things, take it from such a different perspective. But it's such such valuable information. And I think that's the piece that I feel like on her behalf, I like want to be her spokesperson in terms of just like you like getting the word out there in terms of this is there, you know, and I I think even if you do know that it's a really cool technique, it's still hard to get all that information out in terms of, you know, getting it to the masses. Right. Um, But I do think that this is just kind of our small way of trying to get this information out to more people so that they can incorporate this and they can use this in their own simulation well, and center. Even she talked about, you know, inviting movie sets to come mm-hmm. in and utilize the space. And from my perspective, I was like, well, so how did you do that? She's like, I just called them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. For me, it'd be like a 10 day, 10 day strategy of like, okay, how do I approach this? What do yeah. I do? But she was able to bring people into, I don't know where Heinz Community College is, but someplace in Mississippi near Jackson, Mississippi, I think. But, you know, they came into her space and utilized her spaces for yeah. a movie set. And yeah. she just, she she wasn't afraid to ask and mm-hmm. just called him up and said, hey, what do you think? Yeah. So really cool stuff. Yeah. Again, you don't think about it and you, you think it's going to be a lot harder than it actually is. And Elena proves us proves that on an everyday basis for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, Elena, we appreciate all of your insight and all of your wisdom here and being able to share this with all of our listeners. Again, it's super valuable and I think just really helpful. Um, if you guys are looking for more information on um, how to do this cost breakdown or wanting more information on that, um, we'll put more information in the uh, comment section uh, so people are able to view that. But We appreciate you guys listening, and we hope that you guys enjoyed that interview as much as we did.